Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Ask the Experts. Our topic for discussion is going to be eating disorder awareness. My name is Dr. Jameson Merrill, and I will be your facilitator for today. Um, but without further ado, I would like to introduce the rest of our panelists. So we'll move on to introductions, and we'll go through your questions and wrap up with final thoughts at the end. I'll turn it over to Erin to introduce yourself if you'd like to say a few words about yourself and your practice. Sure. Hi, I'm Erin Ebert. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and board approved board approved supervisor and I practice in Austin, Texas. I have spent my whole career working with folks who are struggling with eating disorders and specifically within that group I do a lot of work with LGBTQ identified individuals and the overlap of LGBT community within eating disorder care. Um, I have a degree from the University of Tennessee as well as the University of Texas, welcome and um, have an additional degree in LGBT health policy and practice from George Washington and spent a lot of time researching, again, that intersection of eating disorders in the LGBTQ community. So I'm super happy to be here. Thank you so much for being here. And our next expert is Gabby. Gabby, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Gabby. I'm a licensed professional counselor in the state of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Florida, and Delaware. I'm the owner and clinical director of Recovered and Restored Eating Disorder Therapy Center. We are a multidisciplinary practice that um, specifically treats eating disorders from a health at every size model. Um, in spare time, I'm a dog mom. Amazing. Thank you so much. And our final panelist for the day is Anna Sweeney. Anna, would you like to introduce yourself and say a bit about your work? Sure. Um, my name is Anna. I am a certified eating disorder registered dietitian, and I have spent the last almost 14 years of my life dedicated to caring for humans um, in the process of recovery from eating disorder specifically. I am a one trick pony, and I am overjoyed and just delighted to be here, and so excited that so many people are interested in helping to support this very, very precious population. Thank you all so much for being here. We'll go ahead and jump right into questions. Uh, so our first question is, what is the difference between eating disorder and disordered eating? Um, and for this one, we'll start with Erin and then Gabby and Anna. Oh goodness, no pressure. No, so here there's very clinical definitions between eating disorders and disordered eating. Um, for a 30,000 foot overview, I would say disordered eating is some of the things that strain and stress our relationship with food. These are some of the cultural things that we see, like gotta earn this, gotta work that off. Those kinds of comments, especially like Thanksgiving meal-esque comments, that those kind of things are going to be more in our just ordered eating camp. Eating disorder, we try to look at the intensity, frequency, and duration of the behaviors. Is uh, withholding of food or uh, purging through any means, which is not just the vomiting, are those types of things happening in a consistent way over an arc of time? The DSM tends to use three months or greater in all the diagnostic features, and then you have mild, moderate, and severe based off of a litany of other things. But what we want to look at is intensity, frequency, duration, how interfering it is with your life. And disordered eating may be more uh, socially acceptable things that we hear frequently would be my like, short answer to that question. Yeah, I think you like hit the nail on the head, Erin. So I will just piggyback off of that and say that um, whether you're experiencing it eating disorder or you are just struggling with disordered eating, both are worthy of help. So no matter where you're at kind of on that spectrum that Erin described, you are worthy of healing and you can make peace with food and your body no matter where you fall on that spectrum. But I think she hit the nail on the head. Yeah, I think you I think both of you got it perfectly right. And I want to just highlight one thing. I think we live in a world that so elevates disordered eating practices that this is a really, really tricky thing. And so speaking to what Gabby just said, talking about people deserving access to care, um, 
this can be a really difficult thing to really differentiate because some of what is normalized in our culture and can just be a disordered something and in the right human it can transition from a disordered something into a full-blown eating disorder so i can't really um any more specifically kind of speak to what the difference is there is a lot of a lot of overlap because our culture is what it is Absolutely. Um, and then moving on to our next question, uh, which transitions nicely, where do you start? Uh, so I find myself getting overwhelmed with all of the different areas we could go in. Would love to hear from each of the panelists their path to working with this community. Um, and Gabby, I'll have you answer this one first, and then Erin, and then Anna. Sure. So my path um, started very personally. I am personally recovered from a long battle uh, with anorexia. So from a young age, unfortunately, I did not receive the best of care until I was a little older and I was able to advocate and knew how to use my words to get the care I needed. Um, but so I always wanted to kind of be that voice for the person who felt misunderstood and who was really suffering. Um, I went and received my bachelor's degree uh, from Cabrini College. Then I got my master's degree from Rosemont College, um, and then I started in community mental health. And eating disorders was always my passion. I knew it was what I wanted to do, but as a young clinician, you don't really, it's a little different now, which is awesome, but at least when I came out of school in 2012, you really didn't have that access to be able to say, well, I want to really just treat this, or if you did, I didn't know how to do that. So I just made it clear to my bosses that I was very interested in this population. And as those cases came through, I definitely received them. Um, then once I received my license in um, 2016, I was really able to kind of de facto specialize, I guess, if you will. And I was able to um, go into working in other people's private practices at that time. And I sought out supervision from someone who, um, her name is Christy, she's wonderful, who specialized in eating disorder. And I did that supervision with her and still you know, work with her today as needed because supervision is always a great idea. Um, and then as I really grew in my practice and also grew in my recovery, I just more and more specialized. I also took trainings through Jennifer Rollin, Dr. Colleen Reichman. They have these great online trainings, super affordable and very, very applicable to anyone wanting to learn about eating disorders. Um, also my friend Allison, um, she has won the body justice therapist on uh, OCD and eating disorders, which there's like a huge overlap. Anyway, fast forward from 2015 to around 2018, I worked in private practices and had the privilege of being supervised and building my skill sets. Um, I also received certifications in DBT, CBT, and trauma-informed care. Um, I also have background in ERP and ACT, which are good kind of baselines for treating um, eating disorders. And then I opened up my private practice in um, mid-2019, pre-pandemic, and it's really grown from there. I think I'm going next. Um, I, like Abby, I have a personal tie to working with this population. This isn't something that I lead with when I'm with clients. As a more uh, provider-based platform, I'm assuming that most of you on the other side of the screen are also providers. So the very transparent provider-to-provider -provider answer is I had my own experience. And as a queer woman in a larger body, um, that was a very interesting experience many, many years ago. Um, and I went, I went through the process quite a few times. For some of us that go to treatment, it's not always one and done. So I think it was about my third time through. I left in February of 2012 and I already had a career, I already had a master's, like already was working in higher education. And I knew that since I worked in higher ed, I really cared about people at points in their life when they go through significant change, which is college, that I wanted to continue to do that. But I had such a transformational experience pursuing recovery myself that I wanted to be a part of that in a different way. So same value, just starting to look different. And I ended up going to the University of Texas at Austin, did social work, which fit with my personal values regarding social justice and advocacy. And then I 
was the person that did everything you're not supposed to do. I went into school knowing I only wanted to work with eating disorders, was not interested in any other population. They said, do not get your heart set on one internship. I totally did, did not get it and was devastated. Um, but that led itself to a really great final internship that gave me really great DBT training. And then I ended up working at that agency, which is the Eating Disorder Treatment Center. Um, and I worked there for quite a few years. Then I went and did some visiting therapist work uh, with Anita Johnson and I come out in Maui and then have a private practice now and supervise folks. Um, but for me, really the pathway to working, I think with queer community and eating disorders came because of personal experience and watching people become well or obtain recovery and then come out. And I was very curious about this link between coming out and getting to be who you are and healing from the eating disorders. Like this is just too coincidental. So I love working with the community because I think that eating disorders unfortunately can be effective tools to not feel and to hide and all these unhelpful things that feel really good in the moment. And so I love being able to be in my community and do this kind of work. So that's the path that brought me to where I am. Thanks. So I, I had a lot of very good fortune in my education experience, but I, I came into the field for a personal reason. My younger sister developed an eating disorder. I was diagnosed with MS when I was 15. Katie's two, youngers, two years younger than I am. And when Katie was 15, I learned about her eating disorder. Um, and then I got her in my car and I yelled at her on the way to the mall, telling her she was so like, so smart and so good at sports and so like everybody loves you why would you do these things like having no idea was really going on for my baby sister and so i went to school and i graduated undergrad in two and a half years because i wanted to like do the things before i couldn't physically do the things not knowing when i was 18 years old that ms would actually do a thing to me i'm not 15 anymore or 18, so it has, and I'm still here. Um, I've had the really good fortune out of my dietetic internship. I actually, I went into my dietetic internship knowing that I wanted eating disorders. I went to school with the plain reason of being able to tell my sister that people get better. Um, and then I got super lucky. I got a job at an eating disorder treatment facility. I worked at all different levels of care. I was ultimately promoted to a leadership position far too young um, and moved through um, that program into another facility uh, working in a residential site the whole time I've had I've had a private practice for the last 13 and a half years um, I am just so so lucky and I feel really really grateful to be grounded in my work now in a way that I was not when I first started this work um, this is in every single way a social justice condition um, and thinking about the complexity of our clients and the needs that the people that I work with have the pleasure of working with um, thinking about them as whole humans and really reconceptualizing care um, has has allowed me to you know become the person and the practitioner that i am and i would like to throw a massive massive shout out to clinical supervision um i have a supervision group that has meet we've been meeting for 10 years together every other week um this is a crew of practitioners who have been actively engaged in eating disorder exclusive work and like we're learning all the time uh so start where you start and ask a lot 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 of questions fortunately there's such a cool community on social media and many of us are like super happy to have conversations and point you in directions of resources yeah i'm just there's a lot let's start someplace that's amazing it was really great to hear about everyone's journey thank you all for sharing your stories um move on to our next question which is what are the best screening questions to identify possible eating disorders early in treatment and Erin I will turn this one over to you sure so depending on what part of the world you come to us in meaning are you a dietitian therapist psychiatrist right we have all kinds of different perspectives 
If you're someone that uses simple practice, there's even a form that you can put in simple practice and utilize. It's the E26 is known as kind of one of these scales that you can use. Unfortunately, it's not always the best, especially if we're looking for a binge eating disorder. It may have some problematic things because it's a little old. Um, I typically do not always include that um, measure it if I already know the person coming in. Um, the thing that I would say for when someone is reaching out to me or they say, I think my kiddo or whatever, again, I go back to the frequency, intensity, and the duration. And then sometimes there's other pieces. So my friends and colleagues that maybe don't always see eating disorders in their practice, I'm like, but you might. <laughs> and the things that are the but you might are the, talking about the relationship with food, but also the relationship with exercise, movement, preoccupation with weight, um, how much time, so there used to be this activity we would do with folks, and we would say, well, like, how much do you think about your body, or how much do you think about food, and then we'd have them multiply it for a day, and then a week, and a month, and a year, and you can see kind of the aggregate of how much time we spend wishing that body was this way or that way, so when we can zoom out as a social worker and have a holistic lens, when we are screening, we want to ask about how, like, how do you feel about your body? Do you feel safe in your body? Um, do you want it to be different? What lengths would you go to to make it different? Do you eat past the point of fullness? Do you want to make yourself sick? There's all those types of questions. And so paying attention to things that might initially look like, oh, they're just like everyone else. And press a little further because our, just like Anna said, our just like everyone else is not always okay. It's, I will, I do love my social media and I also love TikTok as an old person that's really not supposed to be there, but we have a lot of problematic things going on like that. Here's my meal in a day and all the shenanigans. So one of the screening questions is really your ears, like, listen and what is happening and don't be afraid to ask more. You can say something from an evaluative standpoint and say, tell me more about that without saying, and how many times do you do this per day, right? Like we do not have to be robots, but be curious and kind, not curious with judgment. That is the, I guess, trick that I would, trickery is not even the right word. That is how I approach diagnostics, especially if they're not someone that is coming in with a self-report. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there was instruction about who's gonna talk next, but I'm gonna talk right now if that's okay. Um, and I might've just messed that up and I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so I am I'm not, as a dietitian, I'm not a diagnostician. I am always asking about relationship with food, relationship with body, like how are you feeling um, in terms of navigating self-care decisions. And as, as an eating disorder dietitian, my clients are pretty self-selected, um, but I think we can be really, like really general and actually just generous as, as humans, as people that are receiving input from our clients in terms of digging a little bit a little bit deeper asking questions about how things you know how things feel how much space and time decisions around food decisions around like getting dressed take like just simple life things um I, for, for me it's just about being generous and curious with our clients thank you both um, and our next question is, what tools and interventions work well in treating anorexia or restricting behaviors? Um, Gabby, I'll turn this one over to you first and then Erin. Sure. So I think um, what's important is that any uh, intervention I may share, know that it is not the intervention. There are so many modalities and ways to help people heal from eating disorders, whether it's anorexia, binge eating disorder, orthorexia, whatever it might be. So I might share some tools that kind of go across the span of the disorders, but um, I think where it's really important to start is with the relational work, um, especially as someone who suffered. I know that for me, it was crucial in getting well was finding a therapist that I felt safe with. 
So creating a space of safety and trust for your clients is an absolute must. So I would say, let's start there. So build that alliance. Take the time to really get to know and embrace your client. They are coming to you because they value you and you need to value them. So I think I'd say, let's start with the relational work. I think sometimes that gets kind of pushed to the side a little bit, especially in the therapy field of, you know, we want to teach techniques and techniques are great and I'll, I'll get there. But I just wanted to say, I think it's important to start with the therapeutic alliance and come from a relational approach as a therapist. Um, then I would say, so we use a lot of ERP, which is exposure response prevention. Um, we also use a lot of DBT, trauma and dialectical behavioral therapy, trauma-informed care, and um, ACT, which is acceptance commitment therapy. But again, there is no one modality and it is really about meeting the client where they're at um, and coming from a harm reduction model we want to set our clients up for success so when you meet with someone really gather and understand what their goals are in recovery and i would encourage you don't negotiate with the eating disorder but please be compassionate and gentle with your client because they deserve that and if you just kind of give them these unrealistic goals, although they may make sense to you as the clinician, they're not going to be achievable, maybe in that moment, but hopefully long-term for that client. And we want them to be successful. So I think a harm reduction model when it comes to any eating disorder is always a good approach. Um, and then I would say one of my favorite interventions to use comes from um, ACT, and I've been using it a lot lately. And please know there are so, so many, but um, it's a values activity where basically you have the client talk about their values. What is important to them? What do they identify with? And then talk with them, have conversation about what does that look like when you're engaging in your eating disorder? And they'll be able to see our clients are insightful and smart and wonderful. They'll be able to see how the eating disorder is impeding on them living a life aligned with their values. And a lot of times that's really, really helpful to them. Um, I also really enjoy with um, DBT doing some distress tolerance work around emotions and emotional regulation, because when we are in an eating disorder, especially anorexia, but I think this kind of goes across the board for all eating disorders, um, a lot of times we're numb. Um, we know that when someone is restricting their brain is malnourished so it is harder for them to kind of tap into their emotion and to use the signals that our body gives us um, so i would encourage them to sit with different feelings and kind of process those feelings out with them because it's about the food it's not about the food it's about the body it's not about the body but as the therapist my job is to help the client figure out what's driving the eating disorder so that we can help it to kind of calm down and then we can continue to heal and apply these inner inventions in our day-to-day -day life. But those are just two of like so many. My response, yes, I totally agree that having a relational format is absolutely really, really important because this is hard, incredibly hard, and sometimes very painful work. Um, I think for me, when I'm thinking of working specifically to the question, interacting and restricting behaviors, I think of, yes, the harm reduction model. I love ACT. For me, one of the biggest things here is since I have such a long history working in treatment centers at every level of care, um, not necessarily fighting and getting in that tug of war, one of the ways or tools that I think is really helpful with this to me is the ACT matrix where we talk about the values of the client. So again, these are not my values. These are the client's values. And the example that I use frequently is if you are or have been at an eating disorder treatment center and you do not complete your meal very frequently, you might be presented with the opportunity to have a nutritional supplement. This is so fun. Um, and no one really loves it. So I had the unfortunate job of being the person that very frequently would present this opportunity to the client. And I would say vanilla, strawberry, or chocolate. 
and I knew that they were never going to say strawberry and we would bring out the vanilla or the chocolate and then they'd be like, I'm not doing it. And I'm like, okay. And I know your goal is to not be in PHP anymore and you are not going to upset me by doing this. And your goal is to like leave, get your car back, get a privilege, whatever it is. So if we stop having the tug of war of I'm the jerk or I poured too much and I'm not doing this and all that goes away and we make it about what you said is you want to be done with PHP is drinking this thing and get you closer to or further away from that goal or value. And so if we can start with kind of like stripping away the right, wrong, should, shouldn't, must, like if all of that can strip away and then we are met with is doing X activity going to get you closer to recovery or closer to that goal or further away from it. So when I meet that kind of push and pull sometimes, I try to remove that because it's really not about me. I am there to bear witness to the experience. I am not the expert on their life. I just happen to have been in this rodeo for a while. And I think really moving the metric from or towards that act matrix of values is really, really clutch in helping folks that feel maybe a little stuck. Uh, I heard you. Okay. I'll talk now. Um, so I think the most important thing that I am thinking about with regard to um, treating eating disorders, just a gentle reminder that this is an interdisciplinary experience, right? There's a reason that there are therapists here and there's a reason that I'm here as a dietitian and all of my, like, like my clients are seeing medical doctors, they're seeing psychiatrists, they might be seeing, you know, other auxiliary treatment providers nothing happens in a bubble. When it comes to working with restrictive behaviors from where I sit, um, I am thinking about, in keeping what, with what Gabby and Aaron were speaking about in terms of harm reduction, um, this might look like making a list of foods to incorporate and thinking about like a hierarchy of your foods and thinking together with, with my client, because I nothing that I do um, at least this, at this point in my life, it, it was different earlier in my career. Um, it's, I'm not really interested in doing dogmatic here. This is what you are supposed to be eating and let me show you how to do this kind of thing. Um, I am more interested in, in engaging my clients in conversation about what actually would allow them to live a more value centered life. I want to be able to go out on a date and have a meal. I want to be able to eat a family meal and feel nothing about it. I want to be able to eat regular meals and regular snacks and just get through my day. I want to be able to have more comfortable digestion. So, right, so I'm meeting my clients where they are, asking questions over and over and over again and being really, really sure that I am um, really closely dialoguing with other members of the team so that we are coming together to support our clients. And I would say this answer stands for people who are restricting. Um, and I, I actually believe that all eating disorders are restrictive eating disorders. Um, and so this interdisciplinary model is, is imperative for everybody. Great. And moving on to our next question, what are common pitfalls to avoid with ED clients? Um, and Anna, I'll turn this one to you first, and then Gabby, and then Erin. Um, I have such a long list of this that I'm going to actually just be a, a little bit, like, I think I'll just be short here. I think it's okay um, to talk loosely about your food and your body stories, so long as you have processed your food and body stories. Um, I think a lot of, I mean, every, everyone here, everyone who has a body has a relationship with that body. And so it's really important that as we are holding space for people who are navigating their own healing experiences, that we're not bringing ourselves um, into, that, into that party. Um, I think it, this is, again, client to client experience. Um, being really thoughtful about what feels most comfortable with the client. So asking a person, how do you like to have, or how, how do you describe your body? How do you feel about the way that um, you interact with food? I am so, I'm so much less interested in 
being um, like the all knowing being that I was when I started doing this job. Like everyone just eats and it's amazing and you're gonna get out of the inpatient unit and everyone's well. I wish that that were the case um, and it's not, right? And so meeting our people where they are and being really, really thoughtful uh, about taking care of ourselves in the process of doing this work. This is the most rewarding. I mean, I, I cannot think of another thing that I would like to do with my life. And without support, um, people burn out. I have hired a number of practitioners over the course of my career, and a number of them have not been able to stay in this work because it is really hard. And so if you are new into this field or if you have been here for a period of time, I, I really, really hope that you are being supported because this is this is hard stuff. So have your stuff in like your stuff is separate from your client stuff and please take care of yourself and your needs. I think those are both incredibly important things, all of those things. Um, and I agree with them wholeheartedly. Um, when I read this question, I think I thought of the most common pitfall I see unfortunately still in the field is that people believe eating disorders have a look and they do not. Eating disorders do not have a size. Um, anybody of any size can be affected by an eating disorder. Just like Anna said, we all eat, we all have a body. So we all have a story around those things. Um, so anyone can be affected. So if you are someone looking to get into this field, please check your weight bias. Please check the narratives that you have around food and your body. And just remember that, you know, the size of someone's body does not dictate the severity of their disordered eating or eating disorder. And it's just really important to meet people, even when it's hard with compassion. Awesome. I agree with those. I probably have some hotter, spicier takes. Um, my probably number one thing, do not tell your client you are not going to make them fat. That's showing your fat phobia. Number two, do not diet and say you are a health at every size provider. Absolutely not. Either we are health at every size providers and we believe this, or we are lying to ourselves and our clients. So pick a side and be on the side. Sorry, there's not so much gray area here. So the challenge here is that everyone, or I will back off of the everyone. Many times we believe that there is health at every size to a point. The amount of times I have the conversation with people about where that point is, I will have that conversation with a client because we are talking about their experience, their body. I will have a very different conversation with a colleague. Your fat phobia, transphobia, xenophobia, all of it, we aren't here for that. And all of those will show up in this work because you will work with people that don't look like you, that don't have the heritage you do, that don't eat like you do, that don't dress like you do, that they still deserve a fix. So when we see what are good foods and what are bad foods, and those are ethnic foods or traditional foods of other countries, what message are we sending? So the common tip all from my perspective is that recovery starts to look like a thin white lady. And I am a fat queer woman who is white and we need more people who don't look like me in this space because it needs to be the norm that recovery looks like anyone in any body. And there's not a look for sickness and there's not a look for wellness. Great recommendations of things to self-reflect on, things to be aware of. Um, moving on to our next question. Will it be helpful to work together with a dietitian when working with clients who struggle with eating disorders? Um, and for this one, I will have Anna take this one first and then Erin and then Gabby. I really love this question, Olga. And please, 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 please do. Um, the interdisciplinary work and interdisciplinary support of our clients is really, really critical. And I hope that it actually provides you with a sense of relief. If you are not a dietitian, you don't have to talk about the food stuff. Like you actually have the ability to 
stay in your therapeutic realm. And that's not to suggest that I am like not a therapist, like I, I practice nutrition therapy. It's not to say that therapeutic work does not happen in my space. And just like I need support from the therapists who are supporting my clients and they need support from therapists, um, we dietitians are really, really happy to support your clients with eating disorders. And I hope that you have access to um, practitioners, dietitians who are at least eating disorder curious or um, you know, willing to learn or particular, pr particularly proficient, but this is absolutely a team project. And I hope that that can feel um, relieving. I, I could not do my work without the, the people that support my people. I agree, I don't have a ton to add, but I don't know that I could do my job as effectively as it needs to be done without dietitians. Um, I'm so lucky to be in community with people that I believe are great dietitians. For me, it's really important that these are trusted colleagues that I have kind of vetted, not saying if I don't know you, you can't sit here, but I want to be able, like a lot of my clients, there's some that I have worked with from middle school, high school, and I'm like, I don't want to take these people whose lives that I have gotten to be a part of and kind of turn them loose with someone that I don't know what their perspective is. So to me, a dietitian is incredibly helpful, so necessary. And sometimes, let's be honest, this can be an acute population. And holding someone's hand while you have a tough case is really feels a whole lot better when you have more people behind you. So I think, yes, absolutely dietitian. And then my like one B behind having a dietitian is having a medical doctor, psychiatrist. Like I want to have the whole team. That interdisciplinary team is absolutely critical. I second and third that. That was absolutely on point. A team is so, so critical. I think one thing I just want to note that having a team is a privilege, both as providers, it's a privilege to have a teammate or teammates. But also when we say to our clients, you know, hey, I need you to see a registered dietitian, you should try to help them find one. And it, like Erin said, let's have it be someone that you trust and you feel good about. Um, they should be help at every size. That is imperative when working with this population. Um, but remembering that adding anyone to the team is a privilege and we can't make it an expectation. We can just make it a recommendation. points everyone and moving along um so when to know it's time to refer out and how to find reputable referral partners um so Erin I'll let you take this one first and then Anna and then Gabby so I think referring out there can be a couple of different reasons why we do this one we refer out like if something's happening with us right where we can't be on the, this case anymore or we're moving or they're they're moving any of those things um, but the referring out that I think is important to think about is when are we talking about a higher level of care? Is that possible financially? What's doable? Are the beh behaviors, are the eating disorder symptoms getting worse or not responding to the course of treatment that we are trying to do outpatient as someone who's worked in every level of care? I feel like personally, I have an eye for what things are starting to look like because I've seen it in lots of different settings. But the thing that I would really encourage is to start the conversation sooner than you think you need to, because the amount of time to get someone on board, the amount of time to get them like warmed up to the idea, to do the assessment. And what is heartbreakingly terrible right now is that um, the amount of folks experiencing eating disorder either resurgent or new eating disorder diagnosis in COVID-19 is completely out of control, which means the wait list to get into somewhere is really disappointingly long. It is so heartbreaking. So now we have a situation where people that need residential might be in partial hospitalization because we're waiting for a bed. And all of the levels of care are more acute than they would have been maybe five years ago. So that might even mean that us as outpatient providers are holding people that could really be in a different level of care. 
And if you are doing that, please take time for yourself, be in supervision or consultation, be in community. And I think that's the second answer. How do you find reputable referral partners? In my town, we have something called CTED, Central Texas Eating Disorder Specialist. There's HEADS, which is Houston Eating Disorder Specialist. Find people in your community that do this work, lean on them, get their opinion. And there are, I mean, and I said, I'm not, I think we all have public Instagrams, find us, we'll talk with you. There's a lot of people doing this work that want good work to be done. So please don't let the referral piece of like, where do I send someone or what can I do be a scary barrier and start the conversation early. Okay, I'm just, no. it's, um, I'm, I'm gonna just, um, jump on that and I don't really have a lot to add and the only thing I'm going to say is if you don't feel comfortable holding someone with an eating disorder or if it feels like Ooh, I thought this was okay but I am feeling like I need either more support or I feel like this is something that I am not comfortable um, hanging on to please do seek out eating disorder community and please 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 if you are not okay working with someone who is, it doesn't really matter actually what's going on, but if you find yourself in a place where you're feeling like you're not able to care for a person, um, there is absolutely, it, like it is, it is imperative that you make referrals to get that person to someone who can more appropriately take care of them. We know that eating disorders are the second most lethal of all, mental illnesses behind opioid addiction. So this is, this is a really serious thing. Um, and for me, referring out if someone is uncomfortable is, is actually a life-saving action. So if you're not, if you don't feel great, um, please, please, please refer. I definitely echo both of these amazing answers. Um, the only other thing I'll say, which just goes off of what Erin said is community. I think as providers having a community, it is so, so important. And also that helps us benefit our clients so that when these wait lists are super long, we're not just referring to one place. And that's okay, you can have your go-tos, don't get me wrong. But I think the more we can create that community and really network and get to know each other and get to know what each individual program is about, the better we can serve our clients. Excellent, thank you all. Um, our next question is how to support teens or young adult clients navigating peer pressure or bullying around body image, non-binary or queer expression. And Erin, I will turn this one over to you first. Oh y'all, this is a tough question to answer uh, today in Texas. Um, so I, I think I want to break it down into a couple different ways um, and speak specifically to queer experiences, especially with teens. Um, as I mentioned, I'm in a place called Texas, and we have a lot of things going on right now for our queer young adults. And I want to be very clear. What I'm about to say is not an endorsement for an eating disorder, but I'm going to share why it is a very complicated situation within this community. Typically, eating disorders are seen as not helpful or not a good thing. Yes, I think we can agree. The challenge here is that sometimes an eating disorder is actually wildly effective at helping people avoid things they do not want to feel in their body. So if I am talking to someone who is not feeling at home in their physical body because it is not the right Sex. It is not matching how they feel internally. Not eating can stop breast development, can stop hip development, can stop period and menses. And when those things make you feel not good and make you feel dysphoria, well, an eating disorder is pretty damn compelling, right? So there is a completely different set of things that are happening, especially if people cannot access affirming care. So when we are looking at how do we help teens or young adults who are navigating peer pressure with their bodies and who they are, well, let's stop. 
I'm going to say it anyway. Let's start with we need to stop with the government and the foolishness that is happening at the highest level here in Texas and other states, Florida, look at APO. But we also need to make sure that there are adults that know how to have these conversations with people, that we understand that when we are treating someone with who might be experiencing an eating disorder and gender dysphoria, that is going to be the most intense case of whack-a-mole you have ever seen as a clinician, and we need to be prepared to do it. So who are the doctors that are going to help with hormones? Who is going to be in that battle with you? What dietitians know how to treat trans folks and how we're going to calculate food and caloric needs and all of that using the appropriate gender? Like, all of those things must happen. That's the clinical side. From an interpersonal side, yes, we can be adults and grown-ups and say, like, Oh, yeah, that's really hard. High school's really hard. Yes, it is. All of that is very hard. When people come in and they are feeling not good and not safe in their bodies, what we talk about is what makes you feel safe? How do you feel safe? What can I do to be a safe person with or for you? And then thinking about what we would call resourcing, can we do to make those experiences tolerable? I hate that we're talking about tolerable, but is it I go to school for part of the time. I go to school all day, but then I come home and I don't want to talk to anyone about what happened at school today because I don't want to relive those things. Do we have weighted blankets? Do we connect on a streaming service? Whatever it is, it's really hard. And this question I could talk on for an hour, but we need, the thing that I want to say very clearly is that eating disorders and queer expression are so inextricably linked and it is imperative that we have clinicians who are not just capable of doing this work because they have a gay or queer friend, but people that know the intricacies of what is going on and can provide very, very good care to the community because that is the ethical thing to do. Okay, so box. Awesome. Really appreciate you highlighting the, the complexity of this question in particular. Um, opening it up, if anyone else has anything they'd like to add on this one. All right, without further ado, we will move into our final question for the day. Um, so have the speakers faced any barriers for working with clients via telehealth or since COVID? Um, Anna, I'll have you take this one first and then Gabby and then Erin. So one of the things I like the most and actually really quickly, Erin, I just want to thank you for your answer to that last question. I couldn't have said anything better, but like, I'm so glad you, you exist as a human on the planet. Um, but one of the things that I like the most about this work is the deeply relational nature of it. Um, my longest standing client has been a client that I have been working with for 11 years. So this does not mean that this is a, an acutely ill person that I started with 11 years ago and we're in the same space now. That's not what's happening. Um, but the nature of this work is that we really get to know the people that we are serving. So. For me, um, what was really wonderful is I live in Massachusetts and insurance started covering sessions right away for me to work from home. So I didn't miss a day. I closed my office on a Thursday and I started working again on Monday. Um, and I feel, and actually I, I really, really, really miss people like being in space with people. And as a disabled person, um, I have made the decision uh, to not go back to my office. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to remain in a virtual office situation. I feel really, really grateful because of the, the relational nature of the work that I do with my clients. I've been really surprised, but very, very pleased um, that this is still relational work and people are still healing and recovery efforts are still happening. Of course it feels different and I really, really, really miss being in space with my clients. Um, and for me, I think the biggest barrier is mostly, I mean, like I miss eating with people and I'm just gonna have to like, so I still eat with people. It's just not, we're not sharing the same thing at the same time. Um, but whatever you all decide about moving forward with in-person or not in-person, um, I'm delighted to say that telehealth actually works. 
Yeah, I totally agree. Um, the relational nature of our work, of course, I miss my clients and just their energy and being able to be in such close, you know, closeness with them physically. But um, I have actually think I a silver lining of this pandemic, I think, is it has made care a little more accessible, um, you know, especially for like some of my younger, my teen clients, they would forget, right? But then they get this text on their phone and the link's right there. So they do it from their car. And then we are able to have consistency in our work together. So I think it has improved show rates, which is a great thing because the more consistent we can be with care, the more we can help people get well. Um, I also think this allows us as providers to um, work in a way we haven't worked before. So I think that's really cool and special. Um, I don't think one way is better than the other. I, I've definitely had so much success with clients, thank goodness, because they're amazing over telehealth. And we plan to kind of move into a hybrid model eventually, but um, I think it's a great, a great way to treat patients. And I, I haven't really faced many barriers. Um, I would say in my experience, it's been um, interesting. Like Anna mentioned, I closed my office on, I think, a Thursday or Friday morning and was back rolling the next week because I am someone who has offered telehealth since before COVID happened. Um, eventually, I think I will end up with a hybrid model. Um, for me, some of the challenges have been, uh, I just don't even want to talk about insurance, but uh, there were some insurance challenges early on in the pandemic with coverage and different things. So I think that is always at the layer of nuances that insurance always does. Um, the other piece I think here that is important, maybe it's just because of the age of folks that I work with very frequently, is I think that COVID has really brought the idea of like a national licensure or the ability to practice in more than one place um, is really important. Um, as I see college age students and got to stay with some folks because they were doing school from home longer than normally anticipated, that was great. Um, the other barriers that I think are maybe for like the moms I work with, getting some like peace and quiet to themselves, um, finding time, it's been really interesting. Um, I love my field, I love my profession, and I think sometimes it gets taught in a silo of like, here's the perfect way to do social work. And literally, none of us were taught like, oh, by the way, social work is going to be from your bedroom, or I call it my <laughs> office, right behind this fancy little screen is my closet. So when we think of these things where our clients are now in our, our homes, our lives, our space, the intensity, at least for me, has been a little bit different. So I've had to be much more intentional with taking, you know, what does my caseload look like? How many people can I see in a day? Those kinds of things, I think, are also implications from being virtual and not having that same separation of space that I once had. Thank you all. Um, and now with our remaining time, I want to give each of you a chance, uh, if you have any final thoughts, anything you'd like to uh, speak to that we haven't touched on yet today, or anything that you'd like to share um, with our guests today. Um, so for final thoughts, I will turn it to you first, Gabby, and then Anna, and then Erin to close us out. Sure. So thank you everyone who jumped on today and gave us an hour of your time. That was so awesome and kind. Um, I think one thing we didn't get a chance to really talk about too much is help at every size. Um, it is a social justice movement that is imperative that you are rooted in if you are treating eating disorders. If you want to learn more, please reach out to me. I'm sure any of the panelists here can absolutely speak to this and send you in the right direction. But if you are a provider who is treating eating disorders, you must be rooted and grounded in health at every size. All bodies are good bodies. All bodies are affected by eating disorders. There is no look like I said earlier, and that's just really important that I was able to say that today. And I'm grateful to all of you for allowing me to be here. I love everything you just said, Gabby. I think keeping in mind that we are humans interfacing with humans about some of the most intimate things that anyone goes through, right? We are talking about relationship with body, relationship with food, and the relationship that our clients have and the relationship that we have with our bodies. This is the longest relationship that any of us will ever, ever have. And so 
being superbly gentle with ourselves as we kind of navigate this earth suit experience while we are here um, and being super thoughtful about doing the things that you can do to uh, support yourself as you are learning and growing in this field because if you are in this field you will be learning all the time and there are plenty of opportunities um, to do to do that, that and I'm really grateful that a lot of those opportunities like this one um, are accessible and a lot of them are available on social media in ways that I could never have imagined at another stage in my life so I am really really grateful that you're here and I'm really grateful that you are taking um, this work as seriously as I do this is um, this work is like the gift of my lifetime and all of these humans, um, you know, these are, these are precious beings. And so I thank you so much for spending some time with us uh, and spending time taking care of your clients. Yes, I can't believe this hour has flown so quickly. Um, I wanna thank Simple Practice for making this opportunity possible. Um, I think, spending an hour during Eating Disorder Awareness Week talking about how we can become more proficient clinicians is a great hour to be spent. If anything I said was unclear or you would like more information or maybe you haven't considered the overlap and intersectionality of queer community and eating disorder world, please feel free to reach out to me. I have an Instagram. I have a website. My website is literally my name right in front of you. Um, and I am happy to email or whatever you need to do because I really strongly believe that queer competent care is not just a luxury that some should be afforded, but it's something that as clinicians we should be pushing towards um, incessantly. The other thing is I would love to say take a break for yourself when you need it. This is incredibly hard work. Take a breath, pause. We don't have to be constantly connected. Um, and our clients will be okay if you take a break. I, I don't want to say pinky promise because I don't want to write a check that I can't cash, but it will be okay. <laughs> have good coverage set up, but we deserve breaks too. So don't um, fully give yourself over to eating disorder work all the time because we need you as a human being on this planet. I'm so glad that this is my life's work too. Thank you, Erin. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you all so much to all of our attendees. I'm really glad we were able to have this time to discuss this really important topic. Um, just to let everyone know, there will be a recording of this going out to everyone who registered coming up in the next few days. So keep a look out for that. And thank you all for attending. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much. Bye, y'all. Bye.